Oh. Anybody? Hi. You ready, Ms. Julie? Yeah. So uh, thank you for warming up the room. Uh, we could use it, huh? Yeah. What happened is like we, it's, it's winter here. It is winter. We're early in winter, but everything's happening early in the month. In fact, for those of you who are uh, regulars at Astrology Night, the first Wednesday next month is January 1st. Um, our contract for Rick and I, the we Astrologers Union, we, we're not allowed to work on the 1st, even if we want to. So the next Astrology Night will be January 8th. Uh, the first, it'll be instead of the first Wednesday, it'll be the first Wednesday after New Year's Day. And, and while we're talking about January, um, let's begin this evening, I mean, with a warm welcome to everyone here at Soul Food Books here in Redmond, Washington for Astrology Night. But while we're looking ahead to January for just a moment, we would like to tell you about our annual retreat done at Brighton Bush Hot Springs, which is a magnificent treasure of the Northwest. It's about an hour east of Salem, Oregon, which is about an hour south of Portland, Oregon. And this will be Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, the weekend of January 10th, 11th, and 12th. So you can come here for Astrology Night on Wednesday the 8th, take a day off, and then join us down at the Hot Springs, down at Brighton Bush Hot Springs, for a look at the astrology of the year ahead. We'll do kind of what we do here, but for an entire year, and then we spend the weekend working with individual charts on a hands-on basis, and it's a lot of fun. This will be our sixth or seventh year or something. We've lost count. And to find out more, go to brightonbush.com. That's B-R-E-I-T-E-N bush.com. Um, it's an amazing place. We hope you can come to our uh, seminar. But if but you if not, can't, go to Brighton Bush. It's, it's a treasure. Uh, it's an amazing experience. Totally off the grid. They make their own electricity there. It's a conscious community with uh, just an amazing environment. So uh, it's a good way to get your new year going, or if you can't come in January, get your new year going in July when it's nice and warm there. All right, for those of you who are new to Astrology Night, the quick overview, Rick and I are going to talk about the cosmic weather, the larger collective astrological patterns for the month of December. You each have your own charts, your own lives, your own astrological stories that are unique to you, but we also share the collective cosmic weather, and that's what we're going to be talking about tonight for about 45 minutes or so. Then we will take a short break, after which we will look at the individual horoscopes of three people here. Uh, if you'd like us to look at your birth chart, put your first name, your time, your date, and your place of birth on a piece of paper, fold it up, toss it on that round table there, and we'll do a little drawing during the break, and we'll get to look at three of your charts. So welcome to the last month of 2013. And another, uh, ro another month that has a very different beginning and ending. We've had a few months in a row now where either the beginning was really tough and then it ended smoothly, or like this month, the beginning is rather smooth, but it ends on a tough note, we'll work our way there. Or, or, you know, maybe to have a happy ending, we could start with the end of the month. And work backwards. And, and work. Well, we can't do that because Mercury isn't retrograde. Otherwise, we could. All right. So what we're talking about here, and, and there is that phenomenon every month with the sun changing signs somewhere between the 18th and the 22nd of the month, depending upon the month, depending upon the year, so that we do have that two-thirds of one sign and one-third of another sign every month. Yeah, but this month it's harder because 
our hopes are elevated when the sun is in Sagittarius. And, and so in the, the movement of Sagittarius into Capricorn, I think is, is it's, it's all wrong because we're getting closer to the holidays and we're supposed to be excited and joyous. And then a few days before Christmas, um, right on the winter solstice, that's when the energy shifted. And it feels like it shifts astrologically in the wrong way. In a very powerful way. And just as a preview, if you're planning on traveling far to see your family for Christmas, don't bother. You can fight with them by phone. You can curse at each other with Skype. You can throw things at one another metaphorically. And you can't travel with weapons anymore anyhow. Right. You know? So as you will hear later on this month, uh, you might want to reconsider your plans. But as Rick pointed out, we start out optimistically because optimism is what Sagittarius is all about. And we should probably start with the new moon, even though it was a couple days ago. The new moon, which begins the monthly cycle, this one, of course, is the new moon in Sagittarius, that outgoing, enthusiastic, forward-looking, and forward-thinking sign, which, like all fire signs, is not about reality as it is in the moment. It's the reality that we're creating within ourselves that we hope to achieve at some future moment. So we had not just the new moon on December 2nd, uh, which really gives us juice and an enthusiastic and forward-looking Sagittarius, but that fiery energy, that positive energy of Sagittarius got a, an innovative twist from the planet Uranus. Yeah, and we can look here at the chart of the moon and the sun in fiery Sagittarius. The thick blue line, the blue lines are all trines, one-third of a circle, or sextiles, one-sixth of a circle. The red lines are oppositions and squares. The angles between planets tell us a lot about the energy, and a trine channels energy. The energy moves uninterrupted, unimpeded, almost like a superconductive electrical circuit. And here that energy is coming from Uranus, the planet of shock and surprise. Uranus, the awakener. Uranus, the planet that releases pent-up energy, pent-up tension wherever it strikes. And Uranus is doing a seven-year stay in the sign of pioneering Aries, a fire sign. This new moon a couple of days ago was harmoniously trying to Uranus. Jeff said that fire kind of thinks about, how, how did you put it? It's well, it creates a, a, a picture of a reality that doesn't exist yet. So fire, in a way, unlike, unlike earth signs, which are what we sense, unlike water signs, which are how we feel, unlike air signs, which are how we think, fire signs don't think, sense, or feel, they just act. They react in the instantaneously. There's a sense of fire doesn't. Fire just sustains itself. It, it does whatever it needs to do to keep the light going and to keep going. And with fire, there's an there's a sense of the energy happens in the moment, and that fire of Sagittarius is aimed off into some possibility of the distance, channeled by the sense of immediacy in the moment, the energy popping in Uranus. This is a fun, I, I hope it was for you guys, but it's a, it's, it's a new moon that does open up the potential for adventure and new experience. Yeah, and it's highly intuitive. Even though the new moon is a couple of days behind us, we're certainly going to be feeling its influence, particularly while the sun remains in Sagittarius, which is until the 21st of this month. But, you know, what's interesting is that Sagittarius takes you to the other side of your world or maybe even to distant worlds. But Uranus takes you out of this dimension. Uranus is beyond the bounds and the limits of this 3D reality. So one of the things that I think is quite useful about this new moon, and again, it's not too late, and we're going to be talking about Mercury shift into Sagittarius, which is today, I believe, yeah. as giving us another kick in terms of not just looking forward, but looking outside the reality that you know. Take the issues that you have in life, whether they're real hard problems that you're facing or whether it's boredom or lack of motivation and start making up crazy stories. 
crazy the is crazier the, word. the better. Right. Because the crazier the story is, the freer you become. The further you are from this dimension, from this level of reality, and that's a stretch of the brain. And even if that crazy picture that you have or come up with can never possibly come true, there may be places along that road that can come true. And this is a time to sort of stoke the fires of imagination, of creativity, and of intuition, and reality need not be a boundary for your thoughts. Right, and just adding on to what I said before, intuition is that direct, there's no thinking. Intuition is direct, and that's what fire does. It engages directly. But remember, the symbol of Sagittarius is the arrow of intention aimed off into the heavens. Sagittarius is just Latin for the archer, and the archer is aiming the thought the thought of potential, of possibility, into the unobstructed heavens. So with Sagittarius, you often have an energy that, that involves foreign countries or things from far away. Why? Because when we do something that's outside of our regular patterns, when we go far, we have to make it up as we go along. We can't hold on to our old Gemini, which is the opposite of Sagittarius. We can't hold on to those, those, those patterns that we kind of go back to, the, the steps that we know in the dance. If we're in a foreign country and they're playing foreign music, we have to learn new steps. In fact, we were talking about earlier, Jeff and I were, that you know, you know the old high school thing, most likely to succeed? Well, Sagittarius is the most likely to exceed. And to speed, both, both. Well, to I drive think, too quickly. I, but I, I think Aries has 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 yeah. a, being an Aries. I think we have part of the. Uh, but I think likely the, to speed. the point is, if you're not exceeding your ordinary reality right now, you're, you're not, not doing, doing your job. Agreed. I agree. You're with not that. doing your job, and that that's part of Sagittarius as well is the willingness to make mistakes. Sagittarius is the half man, half horse, and mostly horse's ass. <laughs> and if you're not engaging your horse's ass, if you're not putting the full belief in your own stupid ideas out there, then you don't get to Sagittarius University and learn by the mistakes. The intelligence of your own stupidity is something that's worth exercising now. It's Sagittarius is a sign, you know, it's known for honesty, but it, it also is the biggest bullshitter of the Zodiac. But what those two things... Exagitarious. Exagitarious, right. <laughs> what those things have in common is expanding the boundaries of where we are right now. And as long as you're not doing that with your tax return, you know, or with your medication, it's a worthwhile experiment. Now, I want to just put something out there that we'll come back to in a few moments, but this is part of the magic of this month. Because in astrology, every planet relates to a sign and every sign relates to a planet. The planet of expansion and big ideas and the Sagittarius planet is Jupiter. And Jupiter this month is moving toward a trine with Saturn that is exact on the 12th. Exact on the 12th. So we have about a week from today where this energy builds but it's a background energy of the month that really allows us to exceed and exaggerate more than normal and do something with it rather than Good just point. fall off the edge of the map. Good point, because Sagittarius and its key ruling planet Jupiter can just expand and really lead to nothing sometimes. We can just dissipate the energy with Hot ideas. Air. Philosophy. Right. Let's let's get drunk, high stone, sit around and talk about the meaning of life. And sometimes that teaches you something. And sometimes it just teaches you how full of crap you are. Or that you have to go to work no matter how wise you are. But as Rick pointed out wisely, is that Saturn, Jupiter's contractive concentrated, crystallizing, grounding counterpart, forming this most creative, harmonious of angles with Jupiter, suggests the possibility of taking the larger vision and capturing enough of it to really build something from this vision. Now, there are a couple of other things I want to add about this. Jupiter 
and Saturn were trying back on July 17th this year. This trying, this harmonious connection between the planets of expansion and contraction is the second in the series. The third and last this time around is in May, on the 24th of May, this coming year, 2014. And that really is, from a strategic point of view, where we're aiming in terms of crystallizing a big plan or uh, a larger point of view. The other thing I wanted to say, and it's Sagittarian time, Rick and I could each probably give three-hour talks tonight, but... And we will, and the doors are locked. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Welcome. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. At, at, at any rate, here's what's interesting. We started talking about Sagittarius, and today, in fact, Mercury, the planet of communication, went into Sagittarius, which is really appropriate for speaking enthusiastically in an exaggerated ways, as Rick said, exaggerious, and saying sometimes too much. But the thing is this, while there's this sort of enthusiasm or optimism or hope, turning it into reality, which Jupiter and Saturn together can do, requires something different because Jupiter and Saturn are in water signs. Water, as Rick said, is the element of feeling. So what this means is our big ideas need a ground of emotional credibility within ourselves to take root. In other words, imagine that the 12th, and it's really effective several days before and after, you went in to see the authorities, Jupiter and Saturn, to present your plan, to tell them about all your ideas. And basically, they're not going to be dazzled by the brilliance of the idea unless it takes root in the gut. If it's something that you can feel, not something that you just say and think, then I think you have a better chance of turning this rich opportunity into something that will actually manifest. And in fact, a good exercise to do, to begin today, while we're still feeling the energy of the new moon, is to make a list, but not just any list. Make a list of all the Jupiterian possibilities, the, the options, the opportunities, the potential in your life. And then bring in Saturn and think of all the things that you need to do in order to make those things that are potential in order to turn them into reality. The flip side of that is then go to Saturn, make a list of all the things you can't do, all the things that are in your way. That's the Saturn side. And then go back to Jupiter and say, but what can I do to overcome these? What can I do to meet these obstacles? What can I do to ameliorate these things that are, uh, that are in my way to turn them into something that I can work with? And then we get to the positive side of how the planet of expansion – Jupiter and the planet of contraction, Saturn. You see, if something expands too much too fast, like a balloon that you blow up, if you don't pay attention to Saturn, the limit, the balloon pops. A business that grows too fast, Jupiter becomes bankrupt because it doesn't have any control. But a business that has too much Saturn, that's too controlling, doesn't ever Jupiter. It doesn't grow. And so this idea of using these principles of, of reward and working for it, reward Jupiter, working for it, Saturn, of expansion, Jupiter, contraction, Saturn, when these planets work together, it can be ver very beneficial. And Jeff mentioned the date from last July. It may make sense to go back in your mind and think about what were you doing in July? What ideas did you have then? What feelings? What was going on in your gut? when the watery energy of, of, of July was really running rampant, and what is it that you may have set aside that may be now back on the burner that you can aim at next May and say, I'm going to make this happen. Yeah, we had a grand trine uh, with f actually four planets and a water grand trine with Jupiter and Saturn Big last summer. Big planets. Yeah, so that was, that was potentially really helpful. Well, I said today Mercury went into Sagittarius. Not a sign that Mercury is particularly comfortable in. Because? Because Mercury's uh, about the lower mind. It's about data. It's about facts. It's about details. And yet Sagittarius is a sign of philosophy and meaning. 
So what can happen with Mercury and Sagittarius is we pump ourselves up with more and more and more and more and more data, but it isn't necessarily all that useful or all that relevant. Or we can have unsubstantiated opinions. Opinions are Sagittarius. Or the cosmic bullshit can be so deep that the boots don't keep it off of us. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And, and you know, I, I watch some of these, you know, like The Voice and some of these shows like that. And, you know, when they interview the contestants, the contestants almost always say the same thing. I really want this. Well, s of course. Everybody wants to win at the contest that they're in, that they've gone through the trouble t to get to. And the Sagittarian energy at its worst, well, near worst, can lead us to believe that our wanting it, the enthusiasm, is what we need to make it happen. And clearly, that's not enough. If you're just running on your enthusiasm, you're not going to get that trip to Tahiti. You're not going to get that PhD. You're not going to get that perfect partner, not as long as Jupiter and Saturn are sitting there in water signs and going, come on, do you really need it? Is it something that resonates with you at a level beyond that of this sort of promising, you know, the sort of fake hyper-optimism that we Americans are very good at? You know, well, we may meet some of that. And yet, with Jupiter and Saturn and water signs, the irony is to have your most enthusiastic dream come true requires a good dose of skepticism. Not a skepticism that you won't do it or that you can't do it, but a skepticism that says, as Rick pointed out before, there's a process to go through to get there. And if your enthusiasm runs too far ahead of the process, then there's this delay. And I think that skepticism is a bit difficult today, tomorrow, the next day, when Mercury moves into Sagittarius, because Mercury in Sagittarius sees the possibilities, it sees the potential, and on top of that, as if that wasn't difficult enough, Mercury going into a sign where it's not comfortable, as Mercury moves into Sagittarius, it begins to pick up on a square that's exact tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, it's exact on the 6th. And that square is with dreamy, imaginative Neptune. So not only does detailed, data-oriented Mercury go into a sign where it doesn't really much care about the details, but it's now running into a hard aspect with the planet of dreams, imagination, and spirituality. And it's basically saying, I, I used to know the words, but now all I can do is hum the song, and I can't even remember what it was about. <laughs> I was thinking of the shadow side. It's the shadow side of optimism, because when Rick said, oh, you can't be uh, skeptical because Mercury's in Sagittarius, I'm sitting there going, bullshit. <laughs> That's not true. I'm totally skeptical. But the dark side of hyper-optimism is a deep, dark, painful pessimism. That fire doesn't suffer well. You know, if you're a good water sign, earth sign, you know how to complain and live with aches and pains and long-term kinds of processes of difficulty. Fire is not very good at that. And I think especially Sagittarius, which means that the, the shadow side of that, of the hyper-enthusiasm, is the profound disbelief and despair because it's not happening right now. And if you find yourself, because there, are gotta be, there, there has to be some area of life in which perhaps you're not going to be overly enthusiastic uh, 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 during the next three weeks or so, be aware of the side that also says, no, this can't be. This can't be because it's not happening now. That is a childish approach. That's what fire can be so spontaneous and so much in the moment that it acts like a child. Well, I believe this can happen, and if you tell me I have to wait or if you tell me it can't happen, well, either then you're wrong or I'm going to go in my room and be very sad for the next two weeks. So there, there is that potential, particularly at this time of the year, which evokes a lot of weird stuff for people. A lot. So, 
Mercury into Sagittarius is one of two planets that are changing signs um, this week. The other one is that Mars, what, what's interesting is, is that if we back this up a day, you can see that Mercury is at the end of Scorpio, Mars is at the end of Virgo, and Venus is moving toward the end of Capricorn. And so Mercury changes signs, and then Mars changes signs on the 8th, and we think that Venus is ready to change signs, but we have a problem here with Venus that we'll get to in a moment, and it's, you all know about Mercury retrograde. Well, we got Venus retrograde coming later this month, and then Mars retrograde coming early next year, and these are less frequent, but we can feel them every bit as much. So we have Mars moving into Libra. Yeah, and that's like... How can I say this nicely? This you seems can't. to be a fairly adult crowd. <laughs> well, it's basically like Mars going into Libra is going to last forever. Mars normally zips through a sign in seven weeks. But Mars turns retrograde next year and will be in Libra, a sign that it hates. It will be in Libra until sometime in July of 2014. We have Seven months. Uh, yeah, more than seven, seven months of Mars months. in Libra, which is like putting your balls in a blind trust. It basically <laughs> takes the wow. Mars energy, which is male or female, a testosterone, adrenaline force, and it puts it through this vaporizer that has us all making Richard Simmons look macho. So w this is a period of time in which the issues of anger, negotiation, and relationships are shifting to a place in which the usual force, bullying, pushing is less likely to be effective. Well, as Jeff often says, a lot of the, there, there is no good signs or bad. Well, maybe there are. No, there are no good signs or bad signs. Good planets or bad planets, but there are there are situations of higher levels of difficulty. And the reason why Mars in Libra is a higher level of difficulty is that Libra wants to be nice. Libra is a Venus-ruled sign. Mars is the god of war. Mars doesn't want to be n nice. Mars wants to win at all costs. Mars wants to defend its territory and take yours. <laughs> I mean, so Mars wants to engage. However, it's not all bad news because when you combine the martial side of the militaristic Mars with the sweet and well-balanced artistic side of Libra, you get martial arts. You get, you get a, assertion rather than aggression or you get aggression that is tactical or strategic. Chess is a perfect example of a dysfunctional Mars, because you're not killing anyone, and a functional Mars Libra, or, you know, that because, because there's rules of engagement and it becomes about strategy, and it's still about winning, but it doesn't have the instantaneity of Mars that says, you piss me off, bam, done. Instead, in Libra, it has to deal with the negotiation and the process, and it has to win nicely. Yeah, and I want to point out that if you have Mars in Libra, it's perfect. It's, it's, it's perfect for you. There's no reason that you can't be very successful in life and in using your Mars. It's a longer journey. When a planet is in its home sign, Aries being the home sign for Mars, the sign and the planet are similar. So it's bang, it's a direct hit. When a planet is in a sign opposite its home, such as Mars in Libra, the bang, the adrenaline energy, which is Mars, has to go through this process of how will this affect other people? Will they like it? Will they not like it? Which is more complex. But when it's learned, which is much easier to do when it's in your own chart than when we're just passing through, then I think it's better than having a planet in its own sign because it has more levels of dimension. It's like taking two people, one who is very physically strong and stayed that way throughout her whole life and another who is physically weak but built herself up. The latter will have an understanding of both strength and weakness. 
that the former did not. And that's the benefit for challenges in life sometimes, but certainly some of these astrological patterns as well. Now, the other challenge of this forever Groundhog Day repetition of Mars staying in Libra from December until next July is the fact that as Mars inches its way through Libra, it will go opposite. We'll get here in a little more detail in a moment, but we're on Mars and Libra, and this picture is compounded because remember the ongoing Uranus-Pluto square that's been with us for a couple years and will be with us yet for a couple of years, which is about all these global and individual transformations and, and meltdown and reconstruction and reinventing ourselves. Well, as Mars moves through Libra, it's going to oppose Uranus and square Pluto that is going to create some additional stress on the fact that Mars already doesn't like to be in Libra. Right. So if we're in a period of transformation, which is probably, we're probably always all in periods. All of us. All of us all the time, but astrologically, the Uranus-Pluto square, these two outer planets at right angles with one another from 2012 to 2015 make this an even juicier time. Mars entering the picture ratchets up the intensity. And yet what Mars in Libra offers us is the possibility of strategically and gracefully and graciously managing radical change. Yeah. That's, you know, the trigger. Mars is the trigger. The trigger is in a very sensitive place. And we can use that sensitivity, that strategic sense of, well, if I do this move, what am I likely to get back in response to that? Mars in Libra is the uh, capacity to respond. It's like life is a tennis game, but you never get to serve. You only get to return serve. So here we've got a greater capacity, perhaps, for responding and reacting to what's being given to us, although it might be a little bit difficult, more difficult to get new things off the ground. And when we do want to get new things off the ground, double check, triple check to see who it affects, how it affects them, is there support lined up so that you've got it, don't make assumptions. Mars says, you know, if you're going to do something, when I'm in Libra, make sure you're just not off there on your own. Be aware of the environment you're in. So we have Mercury moved into Sagittarius today. We have Mars moving into Libra on the 8th. And then Mercury, oh, well, let's, let's stop here on a moon transit on the 9th, only because we don't normally do moon transits. I just want to, uh, uh, for those who listen carefully, it's the, se I said it, Mars went into Libra on the 7th, which it does, um, I think here, Rick uses East Coast time because he always writes his column for the East Coast. I guess I'm from, from New York. Right, but I'm <laughs> from New York, but I've, I've adapted. So uh, for us, it'll be on the 7th. That's right. That's all. That's right. Yeah, okay. it is on the 7th. All yeah. right. But so on the 9th, the moon moving through Pisces makes a grand trine with the Jupiter and Saturn, which is exact. Remember, the Jupiter-Saturn trine is exact on the 12th. But we get a hit on the 9th, which kind of ratchets up this ability to work with this expansion contraction energy that we talked about earlier. On the 10th, Mercury, following where the new moon was um, last week, or just a couple days ago, Mercury forms a harmonious trine with Uranus, which I think is kind of what you were saying before, though you weren't talking about this specifically, and that's the innovative ideas, the futuristic mm -hmm. thinking. Here we get a shot at that again. And this leads up to the full moon on the 17th. Now, the full moon occurs every month. It's the moon's opposition to the sun. It's the polarization of the yin and the yang, of the night and of the day, of the conscious and of the instinctive. The sun in Sagittarius is that, is the will to go far. And the moon in Gemini is the need to attend or the possibility of being distracted by the million and one things going on around here. Gemini is about all of this stuff. It's the multiplicity of things that are within reach. Sagittarius is the one big thing that may be be 
beyond our reach. And together, they have a great deal to do with the mind. Again, Mercury is associated with Gemini, the lower or concrete, data-oriented mind, and Jupiter is associated with Sagittarius, the philosophical or higher mind. Yeah, the other interesting thing about this full moon is that Uranus, which had been retrograde for the past five, six months, turns direct that day. And, and normally, when the outer planets go from retrograde to direct, it's almost not noticeable. But this, I think, is particularly important because, A, Uranus played a strong role in the new moon just two weeks ago. B, what this means is that Uranus will be then marching closer back toward the square with Pluto toward the fifth of seven squares that these two planets make from 2012 through 2015. Um, and that next square is not until next March, but, but, but intuitively we know that the action is heating up again. And I think that this full, that this full moon really does, I think the, wor the, the word that you use that I like it's, is information. It's, it's about the, the difference between the information that we get on an ongoing basis that almost becomes the noise of the fabric of our life. That's Gemini. That's, thank you. And the information that we use as we combine these little bits of information into whatever our goal is, into, our, into what we're reaching toward, that Sagittarius, the arrow aiming towards something off into the future. Yeah, the higher voice, the yep. voice of, of God or the goddess, whatever represents that highest. That's very Sagittarian. And, and it's a good idea to think of Gemini as that noise or that, that data that just keeps flying. So this is very mentally open. It's a relatively benign full moon in so far as there are no major hard angles, stressful planetary patterns to the sun or the moon. No, and, and, and if anything, I mean, we're still getting the benefits of this, but there is something else that's cooking that has to do with Venus slowing down. I mean, Venus is almost not moving already on the day of the full moon. You were gonna say something else. Yeah, there, I, I just had another thought about what we can learn about this uh, Gemini full moon is that our highest goals, our highest ideas and aspirations, which Sagittarius is about, need to be lived out in little ways in our daily lives. That even if you can't become a vegan and you think you should, or even if you can't meditate for two hours a day and you think you should, or even if you think you should love everybody unconditionally and you can't, Notice when you act graciously to someone who you want to spit at, and that's progress. Notice when you, you've taken a five-minute meditation. Notice when you've sort of passed on the, the, uh, the pork chop, you know, um, that, that what Gemini is about is taking the highest ideals of Sagittarius and, and, and sort of expressing them in smaller forms. Now, for the super-religious or moralistic, that screws the whole thing up. If you're a purist, that's a mess. But if you're not an absolute purist, having little hors d'oeuvres of the ideal meal is sometimes the best that we can do and still keeps our taste alive for that bigger banquet of meaning. Venus. Venus retrograde. Dun, 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 dun. Venus retrograde. Now, the planets run in groups and uh, of various combinations, and Venus and Mars are a pair. Venus, you know, all you got to do is go to a place where they're used as gender symbols on bathroom doors, and you will see that Venus and Mars are paired, but they're the two planets bracketing the Earth. Attractive Venus, the ideal of love and beauty and peace and harmony is going toward the center, toward the sun. And Mars, that warrior, that, that young energy heading out into a new direction, sits outside the Earth's orbit. Well, we've talked about Mars and its long stay in Libra. And now Venus, this gracious, loving planet, in a sign that she doesn't hate, but it itches a little bit for her to be in the tweed of Capricorn. Has, it's because she has handcuffs on. Uh, well, that's <laughs> to, each, to each their own fantasy. Um, 
Well, Capricorn <laughs> is a sign of restraint. It wasn't just my fantasy, just for the record. It's Cap Capricorn no, it wasn't this only fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Um, Capricorn is about restraint. Capricorn is about delayed gratification. It's about working toward a goal. Venus is about pleasure. It's about sensuality. Venus in Capricorn does real well when she is restrained. And I don't necessarily mean by handcuffs. What I mean is by the rules. When Venus is working within a set of known rules in Capricorn, she's fine. But Venus works best when, they're, when, when the only rule is find pleasure. And so Venus turns retrograde before escaping Capricorn and going into Aquarius, which it looks like she does. But, you know, you, you can see that she barely moves at all for a couple of days. And then she turns retrograde on the 21st, First. I think. Right. And goes direct on January 31st and is in Capricorn until March 4th. So the, the lovers, Venus and Mars, the two planets of connecting with one another, whether in a friendly way or an erotic way, the two planets that have to do with making art, Venus aesthetics, Mars action, technique in action, both of those planets are going to be retrograde. And retrograde doesn't mean bad, it just means going over territory we've already been through. Mars doesn't go retrograde until next year. Actually, they're not at the same time, but it's no, first but Venus, yeah. then Mars. And so we're in this long period of reevaluation in terms of relationships, love, self-worth, and pleasure, which are Venus's domain. Well, another thing about retrogrades, and many of you have heard me say this about, uh, about Mercury retrograde, Mercury is the planet that moves the fastest and goes retrograde the most often. And a planet goes retrograde when it comes closer to Earth in its normal movement. And as it comes closest to Earth, we lose perspective. And it's like the train on the track right next to us that we look like it looks like it's going backwards, but it's really just not going as fast forward as we are. And so one of the things to keep in mind when a planet goes retrograde, whether it be Mercury, Venus later this month, or Mars early next year, is that those planets are close to Earth and therefore intense. And so part of why we have to focus on relationships and our own aggression and how we're going to you know, work with that has to do with these planets right now are brighter. <coughs> I don't know if anybody saw in the, in the um, twilight sky the sun went down and there was a little crescent of a moon. New moon was just a couple of days ago. And just off to the left was this very bright thing that looked like the proverbial weather balloon. Well, that was Venus. Because when planets are retrograde because they're closer to Earth, they're brighter than they ever get. And so, so that's part of why we need to deal with love at this time. Yeah, and, and I think <laughs> another thing to consider again is the sign Venus is in, which is Capricorn. And Rick talked about it as restraint, and often it's self-created restraint. It's the restraint of ambition or trying to get ahead through a particular structure it's in a particular gratif system. Delayed gratification that lasts rather <laughs> than the immediate gratification that may come and go. I mean, no, that is Venus in Capricorn. Right, and the fact that Venus is going retrograde in Capricorn is not only about reviewing relationships, which is this Venus retrograde, but in Capricorn, it's a relationship to ambition and yeah. material success. Uh, that ambition, whether it is career-related or whether it is trying to accomplish something, your love, your pleasure, your attraction, or the value that you find in a particular goal may need to be refrained while Venus is retrograde. Uh, maybe you back out. Maybe you reduce your commitment. Or maybe you rediscover an interest, a talent, or a lover from the past that, that inspires you uh, going forward, going into the future. So that, there's a kind of thickness in the world of relationship because the relationship planet is in a thick sign and going backwards, both at the same time. And at the day after it turns around to go backwards, it gets thicker because we have the winter solstice and the sun moves 
from Sagittarius, the upbeat, outgoing, enthusiastic, ex exaggerating sign of Sagittarius into the same, even though the sun is at the beginning and Venus is at the end, we now have the sun and Venus in the same sign. And so again, that weightiness, the seriousness, the responsibility perhaps comes in an, on another layer. Yeah, and, and the sun goes into Capricorn, east coast, west coast, the 21st. Rick's still in Bali or wishes he was in Bali when it happens on the 22nd, but it's 9 o'clock in the morning, right? There it is. Okay. So we have the sun in Capricorn, and, you know, every sign is a response to and a reaction to the sign that preceded it. Uh, our success in Capricorn, which is about being ambitious, competent, disciplined, authoritative, all of that stuff, uh, if we're enthusiastic um, in a way that's um, honest for us, then, which is a good use of Sagittarius, then we're more likely to accomplish what we would like to in Capricorn. But if we bullshitted ourselves too much in Sagittarius, Capricorn can be the restraint of a hard, cold reality you would rather not meet. All right, now, here comes the beginnings of what may be considered to be a perfect storm. <laughs> and that is the sun is moved into Capricorn. It's 10 days away because the sun moves about a degree a day. It's 10 days away from catching up to Pluto. Remember, Uranus is now direct and it's catching up back up to that uh, square to, to, to Pluto again. And meanwhile, we have Mars, which moved into Libra now a couple of weeks ago um, from, from December 22nd, where we're looking at now. Mars is just coming up to an opposition to Uranus and a square to the sun. And on top of that, we have Venus retrograde backing into that whole mess. Boom, 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 boom. This is basically, uh, and it's not bad. What it is, it's Terrible about. Terrible is probably <laughs> a more accurate word. What it is is, is, is this is a time when we're going to need to process change. We're going to need to look at those things that aren't working, and the more we resist them, the more change we will have to be confronted with at some point in time. Yeah, I think that's a great way of putting it, Rick, because when we take the risks of being proactive, things don't always work. But in general, they work better than when we resist change as the wave is breaking. And because the Uranus-Pluto square is the basic backdrop of dynamic individual and cultural change, every time groupings of faster-moving planets trigger them, we tend to be in hotter periods that often manifest themselves through conflict and chaos on the downside and hopefully breakthrough on the upside. The day before Christmas, December 24th, Mercury goes into Capricorn, which tends to put minds into filing cabinets. That the function of the restraint of Capricorn for intellectual Mercury is this needs to go here, this needs to go here, this needs to go here. Well, that's all fine and good, particularly at a, for many people, a traditional period of time of celebration, except exactly on Christmas Day, in effect of a couple of days coming and going, we have one of the most explosive aspects possible. Mars, the bomber, opposing Uranus, the nitroglycerin. Don't carry matches and the fuse in the same pocket. While you're smoking. While you're smoking. And on top of that, the moon on the 25th is in Libra coming through the same, you know, coming through the same point. Well, that's interesting because... Libra is so nice that either we're going to go into massive denial, you know, and, and, and maybe this may be delayed explosion. You know, the kind of thing where you've left your parents or whomever and or old friends, you know, two days later and you go, I don't know why I agreed with Arthur again. You know, he said that same crap all of these years, and I came this close, but then I saw the kids and the packages and the tinsel and the baby Jesus, and I just couldn't tell him what a fuckwad I really think he is. Well, and I'm not suggesting you say that. 
However, <laughs> letting small amounts of steam off, if you can, in the moment, may be healthier and more educational to Arthur uh, than shutting up entirely. Yet it's not only in the moment, because over the next several days, obviously, that Mars is also coming to a square with Pluto, so the issues aren't going to go away by ignoring them, which is an important piece here, I think. Yeah, and, and <coughs> while you know we're talking about this in sort of a darkly emotional and psychological way, taking these planetary tensions and interpreting them as personal problems and, and issues, which indeed they may manifest as, they are also from a deeper psychological and from a metaphysical perspective, these are opportunities to discover freedom and to invest what it takes to get free. Uranus is the planet of freedom and Pluto is the price tag. So this, this sort of sequence of Mars to Uranus, which normally means we get a hard Mars-Uranus aspect, a major one every six months. And basically it's about, I want to do what I want to do. I want to act Mars independently with Uranus. And then when Pluto comes along or when Mars hits Pluto, then we either suppress it <laughs> because, oh my God, I can't do that, that's illegal or that's, or that's too dangerous or destructive and I don't want to be that person. Or we calculate, okay, what must be changed? Pluto compels. Uranus sort of just makes you crazy in the moment. But Uranus sort of takes that craziness and attenuates it over a longer period of time to give us an opportunity to calculate what, it, what are the costs and benefits of breaking the rules. And by New Year's Eve, when Mars has moved past the opposition to Uranus and is now exactly squaring Pluto, Mercury, which had moved into Capricorn a week ago, is now caught up and Mercury is conjoined with Pluto. The sun is coming into the picture and this is actually the new moon on January 1st. The moon is there also. We'll just jump there just because it's like a pretty amazing um, package of the sun, moon, um, Mercury and Pluto that are all squaring Uranus and, um, and I mean, the squaring Uranus on this side, that, yeah. yep, and squaring Mars on that side, and Mercury, which is moving faster than the rest of them over the next couple of days, comes into an opposition here with Jupiter. So we have the four cardinal or season starting signs Aries, spring, um, Uranus, and Aries, Cancer, summer, Jupiter, and Cancer, Libra, autumn, Mars, and Libra, and the Sun, Moon, Mercury. Pluto and Venus retrograde all in Capricorn. There's some real stuff cooking here. Now, again, it's it's very easy to describe it on, you know, the dark personal side. But let's come back to where we began today. We began by talking about the vision and hope and aspirations of Sagittarius and the innovation available to us now with Uranus, the planet of innovation, trying or harmoniously, creatively aligned with the new moon from two days ago. What that suggests as we go toward the end of the month is that this is a year where the gifts we give to ourselves and to society are gifts of innovation and personal empowerment. You see, Uranus, is Uranus and Pluto are destructive when we're rebelling against others when we resent others, when they are the source of the problem. But as we individuate, as we become more conscious of ourselves as creative people, then Uranus is a planet of liberation and Pluto is a planet of empowerment. And although those are challenging energies to use, I think this holiday season, this level of transformation is a gift to give ourselves and one that perhaps may take humanity from some of the brinks of economic environmental challenges that we face and perhaps break us open toward a new world. Yeah, well said. And I think, Jeff, the other piece of all these planets in Capricorn, going back to the new moon where we've set our 
our, our aspirations, our goals, our vision, that Sagittarian vision, and then we have the benefit of the expansive Jupiter contractive Saturn working hand in hand. And now with all these planets in Saturn's sign, Capricorn, it's a reminder that, that freedom doesn't, is, it doesn't come without a price, and the price is not something that is exacted from us. The price is the hard work that we need to do in order to climb the mountain, in order to reach the goal. And if we're willing to make that kind of Saturnian, Capricornian commitment to, to, to make a plan and to actually work with that plan, I think this can be a, a profoundly opening and changeful period of time that does free us from the past. It involves taking a risk. Exactly. But it also involves not just taking a blind risk, but taking a risk with a plan, a calculated risk, and then doing the work. And how that works, the calculated risk of Capricorn, you can't just build it externally. It has to be rooted in self-trust. And that's what I think the Jupiter-Saturn trine offers. The capacity to trust ourselves, and it's easy to trust ourselves when we're kind and generous and loving and sweet and happy. It's more challenging to trust ourselves when we're angry, when we're resentful, when we're unsatisfied. That doesn't mean that we want to continue that behavior, but if you can trust yourself enough as a source of love and light and creativity, then I think the commitment will come more easily. Happy holidays. <laughs> happy holidays and happy new year, Jeff. And, and thank you all for coming here and making soul food what it is. And thank you, Jeff, for being a partner here on a regular basis. Yeah, this thank work is really is really good. Thank you. Yeah, thank you too, Rick. We're going to be doing this all the time that Mars is in Libra. We're going to be nauseated uh, by nauseated, next July. Not nauseated. Yeah, we're just going to sit here and eat bonbons and grow in front of your very eyes out of out of niceness. But we're going to take about a fifteen minute break. Patronize soul food. Make this place a place of holiday shopping. Make this, this, this place the prosperous, wonderful community center that it is, and we'll rejoin you here for uh, yeah. three mini readings in 15 minutes. And hold on, because I have a, just before we start to move, I'd like also to thank everybody behind the bar. Um, thank you guys, <laughs> Tyler, Aaron, Makia, and Kevin, who's behind the sound. Also, I'd like to announce that Sam Awesome Sam is doing Reiki in the in uh, Reiki in the far corner. So go back there if you're interested in getting in, in getting a treatment, whether it's now in our break or even while we're talking. You can hear us from back there. We don't have ear lids, so you can't close it out. So that's Sam in the back corner. And like Jeff said, please patronize the store. It's there. It's it's our way of keeping this going. Is uh, you know that thing that you were going to buy it. Macy's or somewhere else, buy something here instead for the holidays. And thank you, Julie, our videographer, who uh, will, uh, thanks to her work, this video, it's, it's live through a live stream through yep. Soul Food. And at Rick and my website, stariq.com, we'll have links up to that uh, probably by noon tomorrow. See you in 15.